And now moving on to the announcement segment. And while we do not necessarily have announcements today, Austin wants to talk about something called In the News. Austin, what we got? So before we start the In the News segment, Warren and Fee were guests on some podcast. Do you want to talk about that? And then we had some data breaches from T-Mobile and Twitter did a very annoying thing by closing the APIs for the third-party apps to use. So that completely breaks uh, Twitter if you were using a third-party app for Twitter. I was interviewed for a segment called Tech Talk on RNIB Connect Radio, and I believe it'll be on the week after next. So if you listen to that, um, then it would be, well, not this Tuesday, but the next one, um, I think. But it, it will then be available as a podcast after that. So when when that comes out, when there's a link to the podcast, we can share it in the show notes. But for any listeners who do listen to RNIB Tech Talk, anyway, then um, you might hear me. I was on ibugtoday.com, that's I-B-U-G-T-O-D-A-Y.com, and they do have an Android segment called Android Insights. And this is a once a month meet that they get together and people could ask questions about Android. And I think that for the next uh, month's episode, I'll post the URL on both our email and telegram groups so that folks who wants to go there and spend their evening would be able to do so. But it's once a month and our friend Harshit Trivedi is the one that kind of hosts that program there for iBug today. So is it a sort of blindness technology type discussion? Exactly. Yeah. And they do all sorts of things. It's not necessarily all tech. They have like movie nights. They have other things like that. Um, so different kinds of stuff that they talk about. But once a month, they have an Android segment. I, I was really happy to talk on the RNIB tech talk because apparently they really don't do much about Android. Um, I think they do quite a lot about iPhones. And I was very happy to recommend blind people trying Android and saying, you know, towards the end, don't dismiss android because you hated it 10 years ago you know it's moved a lot on a lot since then um things like that and talking about various apps i like and and there's so much more i could have said but it's i think it's only a half hour thing so um if anyone thinks i missed anything out or anything when they hear it um sorry <laughs> but you know in the time available i did the best i could Thank you so much, Fee. And now talking about the other items that Austin mentioned, you mentioned the T-Mobile data breach. And frankly, I don't know what's going on, why someone is so bent or so intent on trying to destroy uh, T-Mobile, wanting to get people's info. It's just beyond me. Um, the news is that about 40 million people their info addresses, um, phone numbers, and everything else was kind of like just breached. It's just bad. So was this a hacker who did this? Exactly. Yeah, we've and had things like that here before. Where there was, there's a company called, well, there's still a company called Talk Talk, and there was a big data breach quite a long time ago now, but I think they've had more than one. Um, I mean, maybe they're trying to sell sell the details to other businesses, probably. I mean, I think you mm -hmm. can make quite a lot of money with that. Yeah, this, and the sad thing about this is that, you know, it's not just like somebody got your password, changed your password, you know, when they get your address, your phone number and all that. That's not something you can just go. I mean, well, you can change your change. phone number, but you can't, everyone can't just move house. Yeah, you know? exactly. Exactly. And the problem is that this thing is a, like a 
you know, recurring thing with uh, T-Mobile. This is not their first rodeo. It seems like every other year or whatever, something happens like this with T-Mobile. And I'm beginning to wonder why this bad guy or these bad actors particularly think that T-Mobile is the place to hack. Probably well, it's easier than some other ones, and so that's why. I honestly think, though, some of it is because T-Mobile did buy some um, retired military te uh, cellular technologies. So they have some very solid network capacity. And if you can take T-Mobile down with that new tech that they're working with, then logically you can start taking um working your way through like att and verizon also t t mobile does tend to have a lot more uh travel sim cards for people to be using while they're traveling into the states so you're able to actually potentially get your hands on a lot more people's information than you could dream of with say att or verizon yeah but both att and verizon have more customers than uh, T-Mobile can ever shake a stick at. They do, but when you look at the amount of people who are buying T-Mobile SIM cards for travel purposes, so like for an example, when I went stateside, I had a T-Mobile SIM card. So yeah. when you look at stuff like that, T-Mobile may be a lower player in the whole market when it comes to monthly subscribers, but when it comes to those vacationers, travelers that kind of stuff they may easily have a higher market share which would make them a prime target because then you're actually able to target more people on a wider scale opposed to just keeping a local to the region and into the u.s you can start targeting people who are outside the united states it's interesting though because we used to have t-mobile here and then they merged there was another network called orange and they're now a network called ee so i don't know whether t-mobile still has any stake in that or whether you know they don't I, I really don't know i haven't i've not looked into it but um it's definitely yeah, called ee now so we never had t-mobile in canada we had years ago we had at&t and then it turned into rogers so and i mean they're in the same kind of boat Rogers has data breaches on a very regular basis, kind of similar to T-Mobile. So these companies kind of seem to have, you know, relationships with each other. And uh, hence the reason once, uh, you know, you travel to another country, you may have some connectivity and all of that. But I'm surprised, though, uh, Cam, that coming from Canada, that you actually had to buy um, a SIM card within the States. The U.S. should have just worked here just fine, no? Yeah, well, our carriers work stateside very well, but it's the cost. So an average carrier in Canada, when you go stateside, you're going to be paying $12 a day for roaming or a minimum $60 for a one-month U.S. package. I see, because most of our carriers, you can go to Canada and you're, you're on yeah. free roaming. And, you know. Exactly, where we don't have that privilege. Even though all of our carriers work on either T-Mobile or AT&T, uh, we don't get that free roaming privilege. So we have astronomically high rates when we go stateside. You just buy a page, you go SIM while you're there. Do you use that? How oh, no. I actually bought the SIM card before I even left. It gives me, um, I was able to set up an American number out of New York State. Um, I had unlimited North America calling, texting, Something like four gigs of data. It was pretty awesome. Oh, that's but it was bad. a US SIM rather than a Canadian yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. But presumably that's pay as you go because you don't want a contract for however long if you're only there for. And know, these SIM though. cards, these SIM cards actually expire. So I bought the card for a one month stint, uh, one month. It yeah. expires after one month. You have 88 days to reload it. Otherwise, that SIM card is dead. They can't yeah. ever be reactivated. So I actually like the way that works. But it, it is a little sketchy when you're dealing with stuff like the data breaches. You really have to be careful about what you're putting in on that card. Was that one of those eSIM ones or was it an actual? It was a physical SIM. SIM. I sent you one, yeah. Yeah, 
my sadly my phone doesn't take eSIM. Oh, that probably means mine doesn't either because we have the same type yeah. of phone. I don't believe any of the um, fan edition S20s have eSIM. I don't think they're really in this country much anyway at the moment. Talking about eSIM, uh, so if you are in the QPR2, beta 2 of the uh, Google QPR Android 13 on a Pixel, you now have the uh, capability of having dual eSIM support. And that's going to be available um, when the final um, feature drop comes through in March. So something for people to look forward to. That is fire. Yeah. Now, moving along, though, let's talk about something that is probably of great importance, too. And we're talking about Mr. Musk here and uh, Twitter and all that denial to the Twitter API. So all those third-party apps are no longer available, uh, no longer being able to take advantage of uh, Twitter, um, being able to access that. Uh, what do you guys think about all of this? You know, I think it all boils down to money, isn't it? You guys, what would you think would be the cause or the reasoning behind uh, this reverse by Mr. Musk? Yeah, I'm sure it, it has to do with money. It's money, it, yeah, it's money. I, I think it's, this is even worse to me than when he fired the accessibility staff, because I mean, to be honest, I, I'm not saying they weren't doing anything, but Twitter was lacking in accessibility. So a lot of people, the reason they go to these third-party apps is because they're more accessible. So I think this is even a bigger blow to the blind community than actually laying off the accessibility staff. But it's all part of the same thing in a way. You know, it's yeah. a total lack of care mm -hmm. for certain Twitter users, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I honestly think too it all it more than just money. I think it really boils down to egocentrism. He he wants to think he has the money to blow to buy Twitter, and he's got the mentality now that he's basically king in the world of Twitter. He's also now claiming that he's going to step back as CEO, but is he? He's already made all of these damaging moves. Is he really yeah. going to do anything that's going to be beneficial? I think he's just throwing a big fit because he said he was going to buy it and then he tried to back out and then they were like, no, we're going to sue you if you back out and then you'll have to pay X amount of dollars to not have Twitter. And he's like, all right, fine, then I'll just buy it. <laughs> and now he's he's just throwing a big fit and trying to ruin it. I mean, he's trying. I guess he's trying to make it profitable also, but I think it might be a little bit of both. Wasn't there a thing also about that he was going to ban users who give links to other social networks. Did that ever happen? Has he done that? Does anybody know? I don't know. Like, I think you're like if you that. if you did a link to a Facebook page yes. or a Facebook article, he was gonna ban users who did things like that. No, he reversed on that. Did he? he did. Yeah. But he was gonna do it, wasn't he? Yeah. He was going to do it. And so when he's reversed on that, you think, well, maybe he might do it again in the future. Do you know what I mean? He's done so much damage now. I'm I'm much less bothered about Twitter now than I was because it just isn't the place. It. I mean, some Twitter stuff can be horrible anyway, like people being really angry and shouty, and that's not very nice. But it can do some real good as well. And, I mean, we have a Twitter account, don't we? the podcast um we do and you know sharing information it's really really good for things like that or you know sometimes i've seen events like musical events that are on on twitter and, and gone along to them because i read about it on twitter you know and had a great evening um but twitter is hot the native twitter app is horrible it always it never seems to show your tweets just in the order they came in like a lot of the third party apps then you get all these stupid tweets from people you don't care about and all this new stuff that you haven't followed and oh it's just really annoying and i hate it 
Now, talking about him firing the disability department, does anyone know, um, uh, and I do understand if you think that uh, one department is not doing what they should and you replace them with a new crew, does anyone know for sure that he simply closed it down or simply flushed out those that have been there, seeing them as not doing a good job, and now replacing them with a new crew. Do we really know what is happening after the firing of those that were previously there in that department? I'm just kind of thinking that it would be odd that he will totally get rid of the accessibility department. I don't want to believe that that's what's going on. Well, I've not well, heard anything about it being replaced. Does anyone else? No, I don't know what actually happened. I've been watching just to see, just from my own curiosity, if there's like new job postings going up, stuff like that. And I'm not seeing any activity for an accessibility team. It's looking like it's completely just dead in the water. So maybe we should reach out to Mr. Musk on Twitter. Is the accessibility department dead? Because uh, I'm, I'm finding it difficult, guys, in this day of political correctness, where we try to do things right for everybody, that actually Mr. Musk would actually totally, you know, take down the disability department without replacing it with someone. It's hard to believe that such a thing would happen. Not to me, it isn't. <laughs> but no. then I'm a jaded cynic, so <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> there are a lot of companies that talk talk about diversity and things but if you drill down into it a lot of it never includes ableism um they talk about race they talk about gender they talk about sexual orientation they don't don't mention disability some do and they're brilliant and i'm happy that they do but there is i, I knew some i know somebody who used to work for a big company, a very big company in this country anyway, which I won't name, but he, but every single person in the UK who goes shopping would have heard of this company. And they had a diversity workshop and disability wasn't mentioned once. So the thing is that we're not always, you know, thought of. We're always an afterthought, like I've always yeah. argued. You know, no one goes to bed thinking about people with disabilities, and it's such a shame. I don't think no, I don't think saying we're always an afterthought and no one does is fair. I think there are some wonderful people who do, but so often, quite often, we are an afterthought if we're thought of at all, and we have to say to these people, hey, we're here you know why aren't you making this work for us but i'm you see i'm not going to be bother making a big fuss about twitter because to be honest i think far more productive thing to do would be to find a new social network actually <laughs> um and i'm glad we've got um got a group on facebook now as well which i mean facebook has its things as well you know i'm not saying it's perfect but I th they do still at least have accessibility people, I think. Yeah, but isn't it that you guys that use Facebook are saying it's horrible or something of that? Uh, and if yeah, we have a disability it's... department there, uh, what's their response to all this thing that I hear as to how horrible I think Facebook they've is? been, I think sadly they've been spending more time to do with iPhones. They have, they really have. Yeah, and it's like they, yeah. they, I feel like a lot of them aren't users of the phones because, and and especially I don't think they're blind users because like, it seems like in the Facebook app for Android, like they're spending so much time on like putting um, tips in the labels, like d double press and hold to do this. Like, like that kind of stuff is what they're focusing on when you, you can't even just scroll through <laughs> your feed like you can't just swipe to the next thing like with the latest or i don't know if it's still this way but in december they released an update that basically broke auto scrolling when you're swiping through items you have to actually scroll the page yourself and it's like how can you overlook something like that actually it's like though, that happens, in, that in happens the on the iphone as well though sometimes as well because i do you know i do use both because i think 
since I still have an iPhone, it's important to know what's going on in both if if you mm-hmm. can, you know. And but a lot of the Facebook experience is better on the iPhone, I'll I will i have to say. But sometimes yeah. you open the app, and I'm sure this happens on Android as well, because I'm sure it's happened to me. And you open it and there's only like one post showing, and like you say, you have to scroll to get any more. And it's but that's been a problem for quite a while, actually. I yeah, think. but now it's like not sometimes, it's every time. Like you it will not scroll ever. And oh, well, that's so, ridiculous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, though that's quite annoying. But yeah, Twitter stopping you using these third party apps. I'm very cross about that. 